Welcome to the Lighthouse Financial Advisors Money Over 50 podcast with Dallas Davison and Michael Hogue. This information is general in nature and does not take into account your objectives, financial situation or needs. Therefore, you should consider whether the information is appropriate for you and your personal circumstances. If you require personal advice, please contact Lighthouse Financial Advisors. Here are your hosts, Dallas Davison and Michael Hogue. Welcome to Money Over 50. Uh, today's topic, what does keep some powder dry really mean? Well, it's ski season. <laughs> so uh, I'm thinking of actually the slopes. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm thinking of nah. skiing in some beautiful... <laughs> beautiful fresh powder in Japan or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. 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 No, I, um, I, I, I actually think this is probably, could be its own segment of... Uh, investing cliches that you hear, and and what what does that actually mean, and, and yep. uh, a, a good use of that cliche, and where it's not used well. So, what we're talking about here is the old saying of "keep some powder dry," referring obviously to uh, a bit of a history lesson. I'm, I'm sure you know uh, the siege of a of a city. Uh, the important thing was to keep some powder dry, so keep some gunpowder set aside. So that it doesn't matter what happens to the to the gunpowder that you've got there mm. in action, something happens and it becomes unusable. You've got a separate mm. stash of gunpowder there that you can actually use in to so that if something happens to the other. So how it's sort of uh, talked about with investing is uh, people referring generally to I'm going to invest some money now, uh, or I'm going to do something with this money, uh, but I'm going to leave some money sitting over here that I can get access to. Mm. so that I can use that to invest in the future or I can use that for some other purpose in the future. So basically similar to gunpowder, leaving that off the side, leaving it sort of separate. So it's a saying that uh, we hear a lot and that we, we sort of have used ourselves at different times, but sort of a good thing to say. But but really there's a lot to that decision of do you leave some powder dry? Do you leave some money separate or do you leave access mm. to some money separate or do you be fully invested from day one and so um, it's probably one of those things where we think that this will be a five minute conversation and next thing you know we'll be talking about it in half an hour's time. So. It's uh, it's going to open a can of worms here I yeah. believe because well, this, well, this. Any, any time I always think that um, the, the funny thing about so to, to explain uh, so firstly market timing is, is People use this saying as an excuse to try and time the market. Mm. Go, I'm going to leave some powder dry and then I'll invest when when the market drops. And so um, usually what, what I think happens is that uh, which and the evidence has shown over time that market timing just doesn't work. You, mm. you just do not know if, if uh, asset prices will reduce below where they are currently or whether they'll just continue to grow forever in a day. Mm. And, and, be, and even when that correction does come, it'll probably still be at a higher level than what you could be invested in now. So... Mm. Uh, it's, it's sort of those things where if someone says, I'm going to keep some powder dry, sometimes what they really mean is, I'm going to try and time the market. And, yeah. and yeah. I want to leave some money for you, and I think the market's going to go down, and I'm going to invest, or, and I'm going to try and invest at the bottom. And hmm. you know, we've been looking at this for the last um, few months as, as, as the, there's been all the volatility uh, off the back of coronavirus. As, um, you know, we, know that, we know that picking the bottom of the market is is a fool's errand and is, in, is impossible to do. Mm. So I think, to me, there's a warning sign whenever someone says, I want to keep some powder dry. Is it really just an excuse to try and time the market? And we call each other out on this all the time with our own mm. personal finances. Mm. Where if you say to me, oh, I'm just going to keep some powder dry, I'd say, you're being a dirty rotten market timer. Don't <laughs> do that. So what we're talking about here is, is, I guess, what it doesn't mean to me or where this is used poorly is when people say, I've got this money, I don't need it in the short term, I don't need it in the medium term, this money is for my long-term future. Yep. Uh, I could invest it now, but I'm not going to, I'm going to leave uh, leave that cash on the sidelines and I'm going to try and get in when the market drops. Yeah, so so um, we would we would say to that, yeah. that that hardly ever works mm. and, and yeah. that... And it's one of those things, it's not to say that it can't work or that it doesn't work some of the times, but on average, that is that is not the not the best way to get ahead uh, on average over the long yeah, term. Yeah, so. yeah. 
Yeah, exactly right. So, so um, what it, I guess, means to me... So I'll give you the, a story, a real, a yeah. real story of some real clients with really good cash flow. Yeah. Uh, they were, they were, um, they're actually putting $40,000 a year yeah. on top of maxing out their salary sacrifice contribution. Yeah. Putting another $40,000 between them yeah. into their superannuation funds. Yeah. So, um, they, they'd paid their, their home off ages ago, but they'd kept that as a line of credit. Yep. So, um, ages ago we talked about, uh, yeah, um, they, they really were interested in actually taking advantage if the price did drop. Yep. So we came up with a strategy, yep. and the important thing is to have a strategy in place. In advance. In advance. Yep. And, um, really, really consistent with that forty thousand dollars of extra money yep. that they've been putting into their their funds, um, good savers, and what 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 um, I'll say good day, good day, Steve, <laughs> Steve and Alan. I hope, you, I'm sure you don't mind me saying. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, uh, not giving away too much. So, so um, what what we decided to do is if the market fell. By a certain amount, yep. And, and knowing full well that we'd never ever time the bottom of the market, mm. and we still we still missed it, yep. But um, we said we came up with the agreement if they if if the market had fall if the market had f- fell by thirty um, percent, and not knowing whether it was going to continue to drop to fifty percent mm-hmm. or turn around. Uh, or whether it would have ever gotten to yeah thirty percent that we we talked about, yeah. um, we'd actually look to bring forward three years worth of their contributions yeah. yep. right at that point in time. So basically, what they did at that point in time, the market did fall thirty percent in March. Um, they actually pulled back off their their line of credit off uh, or their mortgage off their home, yep. and invested that. and invested one hundred and twenty thousand dollars yep. at, at in in one fell swoop. Yep. Uh, and like I said, we 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 knew that we'd never. It would only be dumb luck if we timed yeah. the actual, actual yeah, bottom of the market. Right. And yeah. they, they went close, but they yeah. Yeah. They, yeah. they they didn't yeah. quite time the bottom of the market. So yeah. what they've done now yeah. is they've just swung that forty thousand dollars of their cash flow. disposable cash flow into paying that loan yeah. for the next three years off for the next three years. Yep. So so, so they, and so so to yeah. me, what what's interesting about that story is is what they what they didn't do or what you didn't advise them to do when people generally think of keep some powder dry is what I think people are generally referring to there is is three years before that saying, oh, well, instead of putting $40,000 a year into that investment, we'll save that and put that yes. in cash and then yeah. we'll wait until the market drops by 30% and then we'll invest there. Yes. And, and the reason that's interesting is because we know that actually if they had have done that, You'd feel like a genius if you'd save forty thousand dollars in cash and then um, you know, share market drop by thirty five percent. You know, every you set a trigger of thirty percent down, we're going to invest that hundred and twenty. They still would have actually been worse off mm. compared to just taking forty thousand dollars every year and investing that, even after allowing for that thirty percent correction. Yeah. So uh, that's that's exactly that's a good example to me of one where um, what that what it does and doesn't mean and where it is useful and not useful is that you don't want to be going. I've got forty thousand dollars every year. That's for the long term. I'm using that to build up my retirement savings. But I'm going to leave that in cash and keep some powder dry. It's, yes, that's really not how you want to use that. So that's right. So, so really, with cash, because I thought about a cash point of view as well. Mm-hmm. And and whilst it's different for everyone, the yeah. mecca would be uh, to to already have by the time you look at planning for your retirement. Yeah. If you're a good savers anyway, and you had Roughly one year's worth of of income yep. okay. across that household already in cash. Yep. Um, let's call that about a hundred grand. Yep. So if you already had a hundred grand in cash, yep. um, and you had good cash, good savings, you, you the only way you could do it with cash, I believe, is just to keep that hundred thousand dollars of yep. buffer there. Yeah, that's right. Um, use all of your disposable income. Yep. Not to build up in any more cash, but to yep. push into your superannuation yep. fund. I mean, the, the rules of thumb still apply. You yep. still want to be, if you're a couple, you want to be maxing out your $25,000 each yep. in superannuation yep. 
because that's free money. Um, you know, yeah, the money that goes in up to $25,000 every year instead of paying an average rate of, say, 39% tax on that, you're paying 15% tax. Yep. Um, yeah, it, it, it really doesn't make sense if you were not taking advantage no, of that to, to, to boost the well, that, right. money Big, in cash. Yeah. But if you had that cash there left over, yeah. um, you, could do, you could do what they had done by using some cash reserves yep. to do that. Yep. Um, look, without... We, we, we're not certainly not telling people to borrow off their home to no. invest, but but it's really really nice once you've paid your mortgage off to have that to there. have that sitting there, yeah. like that, that well, line of credit well, you can pull it, against. It is interesting because it's to me it's something that uh, um, uh, I, I've talked about this at, at length. Uh, we, we've obviously discussed it where there's something different about having cash versus having access to debt. If that makes hmm. sense. So, if you've got money sitting in a bank account, it's it, it's it's very hard for it to make sense. You have to be very very lucky to try mm. and you know, use that money to try and time and then you you are essentially then just marking. <coughs> well, so, well, really, yeah. Um, now, mate, now more so than ever. Yeah. So, that, 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 yeah, thinking back in the, during the global financial crisis, Australia we had the highest um, term deposit rates. Yeah. In the world, yeah. Yeah. it was up around between the six and seven percent. Yeah. Now, um, fast forward to 2020. I mean, yeah. you're lucky if you're getting one and a half percent on your that's right on your money in term deposits. So yeah. look, it, look, it makes even less sense to from a return point of view. Yeah, cash really is just yeah. to keep you with that short term yeah. buffer. I mean, you're not you you, that, you, you you're, that's you're exactly essentially right. going backwards. Yeah, um, after, after stripping inflation. out inflation. Yeah, and that's that's so that's interesting because that's. Uh, to me, when, when we're talking about keep some powder dry, I, I think of that phrase in a different way and I really don't think of it as an investing type thing. Um, what it means to me is, is to make sure that, and I guess it relates to your investments or to, to the way you invest for the future, is that to me it really means make sure that you uh, have a buffer so that you're not forced to sell your existing investments at a discount. Yep. And that's, that's kind of how I think about keep some powder dry is have some cash in the bank that, whether it's cash the bank, whether it's access to debt, whether it is, but that's that's not for um, the sake of trying to use that to get in the bottom market. That's so that you know that you can meet all of your living expenses. Yeah. Uh, you can meet your loan repayments. You can meet any of those sort of fixed costs or any emergencies that come up, so that you're not in a in a situation where uh, the market drops by thirty percent. And not only do you, you know, to me, I'm not really worried if I can't get in at the bottom of the market. If I can't get any more in, yeah. but what I don't want to do is have the market drop by 30%, have, have prices drop by 30%, and then go, oh, gee, something's come up now, and I need access to some money to pay for this, or we need this to meet our living expenses for this month. I now have to sell some of my assets at a 30% discount. Yes. So that's really the way that I think of it is, Keeps some powder dry really only relates to your your income needs, or it should really mainly relate to your income needs. Any of those fixed commitments that you have that you mm. know, this this might come up and it might force my hand here. I might be forced to sell down some of these assets mm. at a reduced price. So mm. yeah, that's right. That that's kind of the way that I think of it is that uh, that's where I, where I think the phrase makes sense is not so much about you know keep some powder dry to invest, it's keep some powder dry so that I'm not forced to sell down yes. my existing investment. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Um, and we've talked about this. Uh, one of the one of the best ways to, to keep some powder dry, which isn't actually about keeping powder dry, is keeping your fixed commi- commitments down as low as possible. Mm. And so there's, um, uh, yeah, for example, we've talked about if you'd like to go on a holiday for a month every year, you can either pay for a month's accommodation or you can buy a holiday home. Hmm. And what people don't take into account is even even if they were the same amount of money, which we know we know they're not, yep. even if you said I can I can own that holiday home for the same amount for my month's holiday for the year, the problem with that is that in a year where your income drops or ceases or something goes wrong you don't have the option to not pay that for that one year. That's that's a that's a really good point. Yeah. That's a really good point. So you're locked in. They, 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 like each year, it's the same yeah. expense. It might be $10,000. $10,000. Yeah. 
but one yep. you have to come up with, yep. and one is optional. Yeah, that's up right. Yeah, and the and the and the one that's optional yep. is also variable. Yeah, if you only have two thousand yep. dollars, yep. like like we've discussed. Yes. Magnetic Island is 20 minutes from Townsville. Yeah, that's right. And there's people in yeah. Europe that yeah. would, uh, yeah, that, yeah. That, Love that it. I've heard yeah. of, of yeah. it's a favourite place in the whole entire world. Yes. Because yeah. you've got beaches and national parks and yeah. hardly any people on them. Yeah. So, like, if you can't afford to spend yeah. $10,000 on a holiday, yeah. you go over to Magnetic Island. Yeah. yeah. And you have a great it. That's right. two weeks for $2,000. Yeah. 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 So, so, um, and that's a variable. Yeah. That's a variable. Exactly right. Now, what I like, um, what we find too, when we look at this, um, people that tend to use that rule of thumb. So they're saying, um, I can own a holiday home for ten thousand dollars. Yeah. Um, they also say that I can own a, um, yeah, a car and a finance. In fact, I can own two cars and a finance. Yeah. And that, so, that's only costing me yeah, yeah, yeah. three hundred bucks a week. Yeah. And, and then they can own. So it yeah. becomes a compounding effect. It's a compounding effect. Commitments. It's all of those things. Yeah, and that's that's the, that's exactly right. Is it becomes a thing where you might have two households that are both spending a hundred thousand dollars a year, mm. but one of those households only has fixed costs of you know they they might be renting their renting a house, paid cash for a, for mm. cars, and only go on holidays when they can afford it. They might only have fixed costs of fifty thousand dollars for a year. Mm. And the other the other household might be spending the same hundred thousand, but they're all fixed costs, and there's no scope to dial that back. You know, most years there's no difference for those households. But what happens is, in a year where something goes wrong, this household has the option, has the ability to dial that back and say, well, look, you know, one of us has lost our job, or there's been a health issue, or there's been you know some global pandemic, for example, or something mm. like that. They have the ability to go. Okay, well, we can just dial back in these different areas, and uh, to me, that's that's a form of keeping some powder dry. Whereas the household that's fully committed just doesn't have that doesn't have that ability, and so no. their, their lifestyle they don't have the option to dial that back in. So, yeah, that that's a big one for me. I guess thinking about those. What's the what's the movie where where I went says you got to be ready you got to be ready to walk away and in, in uh, the movie's so name is Heat. Heat it's a really right. good movie yeah. Robert De Niro yeah. it's a huge cast Robert De Niro Al Pacino yeah, yeah. Uh, Val Kilmer yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah but but I think it's funny for it's funny for a a man who is a has a wife and child and a financial planning business and all the commitments in the world yeah. that's my attitude to everything that isn't really important to me is I go, I don't ever want to own a holiday house because I can't walk like yeah. whereas you go, okay, I go and stay at the same place. I might go and stay at the same the same holiday home every year and pay ten thousand dollars in rent. But in a year where I don't want to go there or I can't afford to go there, I yeah. just go, I'm not going. I can yes. walk away. Yeah. And whereas and that's a that level of freedom is is uh, really valuable in, mm. in in a world where um, you know I think that's something that we see where you look back over the last five years and think of how things have changed, mm. and and everyone does the same thing. Where you look back over the last five years, ten years, and you think, oh, all these things that have come up that we didn't expect and, and weren't sort mm. of prepared for. But then when people look forward five years, they go, oh no, well I can rely on this, on and, this, this and this and this. And this. And everything yeah. will stay the same, and it's yeah. just not how the world works. And so that's a that's a big part of that with the way I think of that, and and it's like you touched on with your even with loan repayments, it's the same thing where. Mm. I don't. I, I never want to have a loan that I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm running bang on those repayments every week. Um, yeah. even, you know, you always want to be in front of those those commitments. So, if, if possible, you want to be paid, you know, a bit in front of your home loan. And that's something that we look at with people a lot. Is that you go, if you're if you're six months or a year in front of your home loan repayments, yep. there's a very different. Uh, a feeling or emotion around that is that you know that whatever happens, we've got a year, we've got yes. a year of breathing space before we have to worry about okay, how are we going to pay for the house? That kind and of thing. and um, going back to Steve and Alan's example, yeah, um, they they actually had more that they could pull back, yeah, off their home, yeah, than the hundred and twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, where we'd had that discussion, it felt about right. Was it? It wasn't. It wasn't. Um, they could repay that loan off in three years. Yep. So yep. you start to um, add in more variables. That's right. If you pull back you, six you, years yeah, worth of well, that's exactly like um, we just said. You say, well, yeah. If you'd said we can we can do ten years worth of that, well, then you're really making a bet that the bet isn't really about the market anymore and whether you think things are going to go no. up or down. The bet is about 
we think we'll have 40 grand worth of spare cash flow every year for the next 10 years, yes. which, yep. as we know, that's that's not how life works. And and the inputs that went into that were, okay, well, you know, if there was a year next year, for example, where they were, they'd, they'd you know, They'd paid forty thousand dollars off. They'd brought. They'd pulled back yeah. one hundred and twenty thousand dollars. They'd paid yeah. forty thousand dollars off. One of them happened to lose their job next year. Yeah. Um, yeah. We knew that the interest, yeah. which which they could in, in in the I guess the the absolute minimum they need to pay yeah. each year is just the interest yeah. on that loan. And we knew that at an eighty thousand dollar loan yeah. and today's interest rates that um, that effectively they could they could yeah pay for the interest yep. standing on their head even if one of them yep. lost their lost job. job yeah that's exactly right. um, uh, so so all those inputs went into that and and we yeah we sort of made the joint decision that bringing forward about three years worth of those, those contributions, contributions yes, about right. was about enough to, to take advantage of the opportunity. Yep. Uh, but it wasn't it wasn't too much. Yeah, that you then in fact yeah. you, know, you that you're actually then trying to, to bet, like you said, that yeah. the it's, situation. There's also an interesting same. one that I, I think with this, um, where it, it ties into the behavioural side of this where um, you where, and this gets into a very, very tricky area of market timing. But, but what you what you sometimes have is that there's um, um, for most people, if you look at human nature, when things are you know, when when prices are dropping, and you know, in the middle of coronavirus, really good example, when there's you know absolute panic in the street. Sometimes what you have is people want to do something, so. Um, even if and I actually read a blog a while ago, a financial advisor who was who was saying that what he does in what he does for his own personal account, just to have some sort of feeling of control, is that he picks out companies, individual companies that he really wishes that he'd invested in ten years ago at a yeah. much reduced price, but now the price has gone way up. Yeah. So as the price goes, he puts in buy orders at at a price that's very, very a long way down. And he basically he was saying what that allows him to do is emotionally get through those downturns because he goes, well, worst case scenario, the price keeps dropping and I'll be able to buy it at this cheaper price and so yeah. I'll feel better about that. Yeah. So it may be the case, and I'm not saying that's uh, in that situation, but for some people, that's a way to, to feel a bit of control around that is to go, well, if I've, got, uh, if I've got an investment set up and I've got these things that are ticking along, you're basically treating it as a regret minimization tool where you mm. go, well, if prices just keep going up and up and up forever and the next correction comes and it's still way above this, that's fine because I'm already on track to meet all my goals yeah. and I, you know, I'm not worried about that. You know, if, I've, if I've paid off my home loan in full and I've got some money invested and it just grows and, and the market's booming for the next 10 years, yeah. I'm happy with that because yes. I'm, I'm invested fully. Yeah. But if I've got that money invested and it drops by 30%, that's going to be really painful. And so yeah. it, it hurts to watch your investments just drop Sometimes a, a trigger or a uh, an action like that that you can take to go well. At least I feel like I've taken mm. I've taken advantage of this price drop. Not just that I'm on the receiving end of, of watching these sales just drop. I've got to do something and, and take advantage of it. Yeah, look, I, I like that. I like that uh, thought it's process. The amateur yeah. cycle. So you didn't even you didn't even know that's probably a part of why you wanted to do it. <laughs> But yeah, it, it's a lot of those things where you go, you, you need to, I think the big thing for me with this, with this particular saying is when people say, Keith Taylor, what is it that you mean? Is it a, is it a financial decision? Is it an emotional, is it a financial decision in terms of, I'm just going to try and time the bottom of the market? Or is it a financial decision in terms of, I want to make sure that I've, that I have enough to, to have a buffer to get me through mm. a, a downturn so that I'm not forced to sell things at a discount? Yep. Or is it an emotional thing where I just want to feel like I'm in a position where I can take advantage of these price drops yeah. and that I'm on the attack and not just on the defensive? Yes. Sort of thing. So that, that's where these sorts of cliches that uh, you might have five different people say the same say the same thing, but they might mean five different things. And so that's a big part of our job is is unpacking that. What does that mean for that person, and how does it relate to their situation? Yeah. Good yeah. place to wrap up. I, I think, think I think so. Yeah. Um, yeah, good place to wrap up. Thanks for listening. Thank you for listening to the Money Over Fifty podcast with Lighthouse Financial Advisors. We look forward to catching up again soon.